Hello, my name is Bill Cluck, co-founder of the Atheist Christian Book Club along with James Walker. Today we have a very special guest, David Fitzgerald, who wrote the book Nell, uh, specifically talking about how Jesus was a myth and is not a historical person. Today we have David Fitzgerald joining us by video conferencing. He's the uh, author of Nailed, and uh, that's the book we're going to be discussing today. Okay, we have David Fitzgerald here, and of course we're reading his book, Nailed, which uh, is very readable. I told David it's uh, one of the easiest books to read, but what's unique about David is he has a uh, really neat way of making tough theological questions and uh, problems easy to understand for the layperson. So uh, I really like that about you, David. I really did enjoy you. not only the book, but your videos. You have a great sense of humor, and uh, you're just a lot, a lot of fun to watch. Oh, thanks. Well, I'm glad. I'm very pleased you guys are reading Nailed in the, the book club. Um, it's funny you are, because I do have some slight mixed feelings, because I didn't write it uh, to make arguments with Christians. So the fact that an atheist and Christian book club is reading it kind of tickles me. <laughs> And troubles me at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we're going to watch the Robert Price uh, Bart Ehrman debate, uh, oh. which is going to we're just going to do a YouTube thing there. Uh, which I know you got a million things. Yeah, to... that breaks my If you watch it, and it's worth watching for a couple points that Robert Price makes, but honestly, you have to read Richard Carrier's um, analysis of the debate, and his, especially where he goes point by point on all the points that should have been made in the debate. Um, it's it's an unfortunate debate, I think. In my yeah, opinion. just you know? maybe it was his Robert Price's health. I don't know, but he just kind of gave up and uh, well, you know. Here's yeah. the thing: I think he was expecting a conversational discussion, mm -hmm. and Bart was there for a debate, and um, you know, it's it's pretty it's pretty obvious there's a mismatch right. um, going on in there. Yeah. You would have been much better, David. <laughs> no, well, you know, Robert, <laughs> Richard Carrier would have been much better in there. Oh, but, both you of know, you guys would have. a debate, he comes through a debate. Would've but I mean, with great respect to both of them, I have a lot of respect for both Robert Price and Bart Ehrman. Well, and speaking of that, I just, James and I looked at Matt Dillahunty's uh, little, oh, yeah. The Strongest Argument. And yeah. that brings us to uh, one of our questions, of course, you know where we're going, Galatians 1, 18, 19, where... Uh, uh, you know, uh, Paul says he goes and meets with uh, Peter, the disciple, his closest disciple, and he contrasts that with James, the brother of the Lord. So, the brother, or, right? And so, and, by making that contrast, you think that there, James was the actual physical brother of uh, Jesus. So, what do you say to that? Well, there are a couple things. But first of all, the Greek has been questioned to whether it's actually saying that. Um, some people say it's saying, I didn't see any apostles, I only saw James, the brother of the Lord. Um, he never says James, the brother of Jesus, which is even more telling when just a few verses later, when he's talking about James and the, the Jerusalem church leaders, he, first of all, he's opposing them. He's saying they're fake Christians and they're bringing in false believers. Um, the whole book of Galatians is about the fights between him and these other guys who he doesn't consider real Christians. That blows my mind if he's supposed to be talking about somebody who's supposed to be uh, Jesus' friends and family um, right off the bat. Um, also, the fact that he, he calls it that strangely specific title, the brother of the Lord, um, meaning um, in comparison to these other groups he talks about, the brethren of the Lord, like the 500 brethren who had that... Um, uh, Pentecostal experience that he describes. Um, there's there's ample evidence to believe that when he talked about the brotherhood of the Lord, the brethren of the Lord, he's not talking about physical brothers of the Lord, and especially when he treats these people who are supposed to be what we think of as disciples and relatives of Jesus, he thinks they're not even real Christians, and never once offers any argument of why the brother of the Lord would be a fake Christian or why his disciples would be fake Christians. It doesn't even occur to him that they're on a different level than he is. But isn't it problematic that um, he would go and um, question, uh, have these disputes with, you know, he and James didn't get along. They had their right. issues. Yeah, so if you were inventing it, why would you have these minor differences, or major differences, actually. And well, you know what he says. What, what do you think he's inventing? 
Uh, I think it's just, it shows a historical Jesus as the backdrop and that these people are trying to work out this new religion. So if you're inventing the story, why do you have James and uh, P Peter uh, at odds with Paul? Wouldn't you have them on the same page, which in Acts they do try to put, the author does try to smooth out the differences. You exactly answered your own question there. We do see Christians trying to, to rewrite history right. and change it to make it seem like they're all on the same page when you just have to read Paul's real letters and you quickly realize nothing that Luke says about Paul is true when you actually read Paul's letters. And why is that? It's because they're trying to, to gloss over and whitewash over these differences that they had. The further we go back into Christianity, the more it's variegated and completely unruly and uncoordinated. Um, and it looks less and less like anything we would recognize as Christianity. Well, see, there's another thing. Um, it's not a monolithic thing. It's You have no, the Ebonites that believed he was Jesus was human and not God. Uh, you had well, the Gnostics. Even the arguments are coming in the second century and stuff. When you go further back than that, the, the break, the divide in Christianity between how Christianity is preached after the Gospels are written and how it's preached before the Gospels are written are very, that was one of the first red flags for me that something's really strange here. When you read, for instance, the book of Hebrews, nothing in the book of Hebrews makes sense if it's talking about a Jesus who was on earth. And in fact, it explicitly tells us he's not on earth and could not be according to the context of the book itself. Mm -hmm. When you read what Paul has to say about Jesus, everything he knows about Jesus comes from scripture and revelation. And not only that, but what he calls apostles are people like him who have had these visions of Jesus and found him in Revelation. And he doesn't seem to indicate that anybody else on the planet has any better relationship than he does to Jesus that way. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because 1 Corinthians 10, 7, he's saying this is where the Lord is talking. And then just right. a few verses later, he says, this is where I, Paul, am talking. Sure. So he draws that distinction, which is very telling that, so why not just invent the whole, you know, thing? Well, the, the thing is, of those few points when he does it, and I think it's maybe there's four total mm -hmm. uh, that he does that, he also disagrees with what the historical Jesus says in the Gospels. But we don't have that. Um, everything that he says is coming from the Lord seems to be revelations from the Lord or from the ancient scriptures. Everything he says that he knows that Jesus lived and died three days later is because it's according to the scriptures. That's a very telling argument that but, he's getting all this from even even in like later Christians like Clement, when they're quoting the words of Jesus, they're actually quoting Old Testament scriptures. And Paul does the exact same thing. They're pulling everything they know and everything the biographical information in the Gospels. They are pulling out from Old Testament scriptures. Well, not like Robert Bryce right. said, you know, uh, the New Testament is just a rewrite, like the Elijah story of healing, you know, absolutely, uh, you know, and the, the only difference the is when Mark does it, he's creating a an allegory, right. a historical allegory. Nobody seems to be doing that before Mark ever puts pen to paper. But in First Corinthians eleven twenty five, Paul talks about the Last Supper, which is a tradition handed to him. Right? No, he called it the Last Supper. <laughs> he calls it the Lord's Supper. He doesn't say it's the Last Supper. He doesn't put it in any historical context. And Christianity is not the first religion to have a Lord's Supper, um, or the only one. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it's it's showing the context of that that Christianity began as a Jewish mystery faith. Okay. And in fact, he even warns he even warns his Christians: this is our Lord's Supper. Don't go to those other Lord's Suppers. Okay. You know, that's the cup of demons. That's the uh, the table of demons. Yeah. Oh, and I wanted to get this in. James wanted me to ask you: Why sure. is Paul historical? Why not just you know? Why is he historical and Jesus not? Well, here's the funny thing about that. Why do you believe in Paul? About half of what uh, I I I tend to agree that yes, Paul existed. But That's what I told him. strong arguments. I mean, he, half of what he wrote clearly was not written by him. It was written by later Christians, forged in his name. Oh, right. But we uh, do have the seven authentic that, that, letters of Paul, Galatians. Is that why you believe in Paul? Because we do have authentic letters like Galatians and 1 Corinthians. Nobody's doubting that. I mean, Robert Price doubted all those letters. But, yeah, he, yeah. And, and, and it's, 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 say, I don't want to. I want don't want to be too firm on that. It's like it wouldn't shock me if John the Baptist turned out to be mythical. It wouldn't shock me if Paul turned out to be mythical. Wow. But that said, 
the general consensus is that these six letters out of his 13 are authentic to right. him. And even though they've been tampered with, even though they've been, right. uh, you know, re-edited and mm-hmm. put together from different edits. So there's, I mean, no matter how real Paul was, there's definitely a disconnect between what he really said and what we have on our pages. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's for me, it, it seems simpler to assume that there was a kernel of truth to Paul in a way that's very different from what we get from Jesus. I don't see that same kind of kernel of truth, if you will, with Jesus. I don't see it. Uh, you know, I wouldn't even say we have that for John the Baptist either. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm kind of 50-50 on the fence with him. Um, and Paul... Here's the weird thing about Paul. It's very bizarre that of that whole first two, three generations of Christianity, the only Christian we have quoted is this one guy, Paul. We've got later edit, epistles that were forged in the name. So of James is not was not written by James. Oh right? yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and we I know Second Peter wasn't Paul written by Peter, Peter but First Peter what. Is that authentic, would you believe? Honestly, none of, nothing, almost nothing in the New Testament is considered um, uh, genuine by secular biblical scholars. Mm-hmm. Um, Bart Ehrman's done a great job in forgery and counterforgery and right. in the Orthodox Corruption of Scripture of pointing out these are the problematic elements in all these uh, writings. So, yeah, James, John, Peter, none of those are considered to be written by the guys whose names they're under. Possibly Jude and James were written by a guy's name, and James, but they clearly don't. The, the legend that they were brothers of Jesus hasn't arisen yet. You know, mm-hmm. in their own letters, they make no mention of that. But using you know Paul as you know saying I'm writing in the name of Paul and you know falsifying yeah. him, doesn't that show that you know the reason they're doing that and saying writing saying they're Peter is they believe that these guys were close to the historical Jesus? After the Gospels are written, yes, because. The guys who wrote the Gospels look to Paul's letters to get names for characters that they use in their their um, books. Luke actually uses that. He also uses um, Greek um, celebrities of the day. He's constantly name dropping all these famous celebrities of the time, like Berenice and uh, um, uh, you know, celebrity couples, basically, um, and dropping names. Um, well, you know, Gamaliel, the Rabbi Gamaliel, right. and have to say things and be in places they couldn't have been and saying things that, about things that hadn't happened yet, you know. Yeah, so but he's what, shameless about it. The yeah. Christian the apologetic, chief. which I feel somewhat compelling, is that Luke is very familiar with history. He And the geography he knows 50 cities. He knows nine islands. He well, knows he's, uh, he's, how the proconsul rather than the legate. You know, he knows these so details. But here's the thing. When he does make mistakes, it, it's very telling the mistakes he makes because he's very familiar with, like, Roman uh locales and Roman Roman sites. Right. Not so much with basic Judaism and basic Palestinian things. He repeats the same mistakes that Mark makes, that Matthew corrects, for instance. Um, he The reason we know that he's stealing from Flavius Josephus and not Flavius Josephus stealing from him is because every overlap they have, Flavius Josephus has it in the right context, in the right order, he has more information, it's correct, whereas Josephus, I mean, Luke when he takes these things, it's always given in the same order that Josephus gives it arbitrarily, as if he's just reading the books and saying, oh, I like those three names. Let's put those guys in. Mm-hmm. Um, and using it for historical window dressing. And it's, and it's really obvious when you compare the overlap that that's what's happening. That it's in that direction. Um, so when was Acts written, in your opinion? Acts? Um, is that what you said? The yeah, Acts? Barton believes it was written in 85 AD. I've heard Christian apologists take it to 60 AD. What do you believe? Here's here. Let me let me back that question up a little bit because I think the first gospel book we have was Mark, written after the yeah the Mark and Priority, yeah 1775. Yes, yeah. everybody's there. Matthew probably a decade after mm-hmm. that or yeah. ever, however That's long. That's consensus. Stuff. Yeah, Luke Luke could not have been written before uh, Josephus wrote his book um, in ninety three or ninety four. I mean, full stop. It, he borrows from that book. He steals from that book. There's no way it was written as early as the early nineties, mm-hmm. and the evidence points the other direction that's somewhere in the, the early 2nd century, maybe as late as the 30s, you know. Um, but you do realize that, the consensus is Luke was written in 85, you know, or in the 80s. Yeah, it's impossible. It's okay. impossible. All right. Yeah. Um, another thing, uh, I know you have major problems with Bart Arms, but did Jesus exist? 
But I think I, it's... You know, I just want to leap in real fast before sure, you yeah. talk. <laughs> I didn't hate it because I thought he would agree with us. We hated it because we thought it would be the best defense of historicity and clear out some of the, the bogus mythicism that's out there, like Joseph Atwill's Roman conspiracy <laughs> theory. It's like, those are ridiculous. And and he didn't even do that. He just phoned it in while he was doing work on better books, in my humble opinion. Right. But, but go ahead. But his, um, his broad uh, statement is that you have multiple witnesses throughout the Mediterranean written at different locations in the Mediterranean, like M and L, Matthew's special source M and Luke's special source L. I have sources we don't even know existed. Oh, I know. We don't even know existed. But they, yeah. Matthew's special source had to come from somewhere, his writings that are unique to Matthew. It, and Luke's, well, go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree. But that doesn't mean they didn't come from his imagination or his own scriptural exegesis. Well, That's the thing. Could be, um, but... And, uh, for instance, a Q source simply appears to be just where Luke is stealing from Matthew as well as Mark. Mm -hmm. That's I I agree with those scholars who make that argument. But you know the whole thing, the speeches and acts. What he's saying is that you just have all these multiple witnesses and multiple attestation, which is one of the criteria for establishing historicity. And it's, it seems yes, but those are those would be criteria. Except we don't have that. These are not independent criteria. All four of our Gospels are clearly taken from Mark, that first Gospel. Uh, Mark and Priority, the reason it's so strong is because it's so obvious. The synoptic problem is 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 not... That's why Q is still around, because it's been linked to Mark and Priority. But the fact is, it's obvious that Mark is the source that these guys are... The primary source these guys are using. Oh, and well, absolutely. I mean, Matthew copies like 90%, Luke 50%, but absolutely. still there's some things that are unique to them, correct? Right. But that doesn't mean they come from a... Oh, so a, he's just oral. making it up, you're saying. If no, we have no evidence that there's an oral tradition going on, because all these sources seem to be literary traditions. And in fact, I go in great detail in the book, Jesus, Mithing in Action, looking at Mark, looking at the sources and the literary techniques that he's using, and looking at how Mar Matthew and Luke and John go their own ways with it. Oh, speaking of that, how's your reception to been to Myth Jesus, Mithing in Action? Because I definitely want to read it. I, and I hope you do, and I hope all of you do, actually. Right. But, um, when Nail came out in 2007, or sorry, 2010, um, I was really pleased with the reaction, but really shocked that there were atheists out there who just not only disagreed with it, that's not special, but they really hated it and said, this is pseudo-history. Now that Mything in Action has come out, the reaction has been ten times better. I don't oh, have really? not gotten any pushback on, right, oh, that's, that's right. pseudo-history. I've gotten so much more of, oh, okay, now I see. Now you have so much more footnotes, you know. I've <laughs> uh, been really um, pleased at the reaction to, to the new book. Okay. And I, I wrote it for them. I wrote it for those atheists who say, try to tell me we have good evidence for Jesus. So like, you know, I don't have a problem if there was a Jesus, but our evidence isn't pointing towards that. And that's really the only reason I even make a fuss over it, is that I just don't think that's how it happened. And we know, uh, speaking of the non-Christian sources, we know like uh, Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, uh, yeah. all these are, you know, all they do is establish Christians, what Christians knew about Jesus at the time. Exactly. And even Bart Ehrman has said it as much. Yeah. Now, Bart Ehrman believes that uh, that jo the testimony in Flavianum has some historical core, that there might be a little bit of that that might be historical. But and, still and I, I disagree. I disagree with that for, for multiple reasons, not least of which is the fact that for 300 years, though the early church fathers loved Josephus, no one ever pulls out this ace in the hole. For 200 years after Eusebius of Caesarea, our prime suspect for the forgery of it, no one uses it but him. So for 500 years of Christian history, one guy seems to know about this thing that all these Christians today love and point to. And it could very well be a total fabrication. But what's compelling to me is that second part where it says James, the you know, it talks about Festus and the important people. Oh. Uh, and Ananias, the high priest. But then he says, just off the cuff, oh, but... Um, you know, and James, who's, you know, James, the guy that his brother's the Messiah. Brother, there doesn't seem yeah, to be yeah. any agenda there, and it seems to, you know, fit pretty well into his historical proof. You say it doesn't have an agenda, and I don't think it's forgery. I think it's a scriptural, a scriptural note, a scribal error that was put into the text. And the reason I say that, one of many reasons, not least of which, that everything they say about this guy, James, 
doesn't have anything to do with what we know about the Jerusalem church leader who was later identified with Jesus' brother. But all that aside, you just have to read it and realize, oh, it's talking about Jesus, the son of Damnius, who becomes high priest. It makes no sense if it's about our James, the James we know. It makes perfect sense if it's about this guy who was the brother of the high priest, and that's why he became high priest, Jesus, the son of Damnius. Um, honestly, I, I'm baffled by atheists who try to argue it the other way around, it's like, just keep reading, you know. It's, mm -hmm. it's very obvious it's not our Jesus. Mm -hmm. And again, in the book, I go into much more detail about all the other reasons we think that. But for me, I'm kind of baffled people still point to that one. Right. Um, so, but what do you think of, you know, like, give me an example. When I uh, saw John Shelby Spong, are you familiar with him, by the way? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which you're kind of like him because he just makes it so easy for the typical Christian to read and and it's so funny he's a bishop but he doesn't believe in the birth narratives he yeah, doesn't believe in the miracles he doesn't believe in, it doesn't leave a lot left you know he was he was I'm so glad that I'm I'm so honored that you compared yeah, him to him absolutely yeah. he, he's hilarious but funny. but he um, went right to that Galatians one eighteen nineteen thing uh, uh, and then what's interesting I said well I think the ruckus in the temple oh, I'm sorry the cleansing of the temple you know the right. Christianized version I mean is just, um, it seems historical, because it seems that that might have led to him dying and so forth. Do you believe in the ruckus in the yeah. temple? Yeah, I don't. Well, I mean, first of all... Neither did he! He said it... He, 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 go ahead. Well, well, there's all these allegorical weight to it, like including the, the smiting of the fig tree before and afterwards. Uh -huh. um, but more to the point, the, the four Gospels don't even agree that that's what got him killed. John... Um, has Lazarus his, being the first week of his his career, yeah, and has him arrested for raising Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus doesn't even appear in the other Gospels; he's not even a character. Um, it's and people talk about how oh, but the Gospels are so detailed; they give them these intricate details. Yes, they do. And when you compare all four of them, especially the Synoptics versus John, those little details do not match up whatsoever. Especially in the last month of Jesus's life, um, his his whole career is moving in a different way than it is in the synoptics. Um, it's, 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 it's kind of mind-blowing, you know? I mean, this is part of the reason that I'm still fascinated by this topic 20 years down the road is because it's when you, the deeper you dive into this, the more it's like, wow, these guys, not only were they not trying to match up the story, they didn't, they weren't even trying. They didn't care if people... Right, yeah, like John wasn't concerned about the, uh, you know, the order. You know, he just throws it into the beginning, which is like blowing up the White House twice. I mean, it makes no sense at all, unless exactly. you're a Christian. And, and, and they and actually, you know, a Christian apologetic is there is two cleansings of the temple. Oh, but oh, one thing... That's ridiculous, too. But, yeah. but it's like, why would... Christians can't explain to me, why was he not stoned for blasphemy five minutes out of the gate in John? In, in, Matt, right, in right, Mark, yeah. He's basically a secret messiah, telling people, no, don't tell them everyone when I, where I touched you. But in John, he's like wearing a t-shirt that says, I am God, and, and doesn't care who knows it. <laughs> but see, that's what these discrepancies lead me to believe. And I'll give you an example. Is, you know, the, when, um, what's his name, Judas hangs himself right. in, one, in the Gospel of uh, Matthew. And in Acts, he falls off a cliff. So you have two different... <laughs> Yeah, and it's even more weird than that because Acts doesn't even say he fell off a cliff. It said he went into the, the field and falling down, he basically his guts ex ruptured and exploded. It doesn't, so, doesn't say but anything about being off a cliff. Does that anything. show a historical Judas? If you have two different traditions, that if they were making it up, they would be the traditions. Well, would there's be the same. two. There's also a third tradition well, where he lived and survived all that and right. grew loaded as a pinata of full of pus and worms. You know. Um, and every, every, I mean, we always point to the, well, it was a, a hanging and he fell, as if we can I'm, harmonize that. Yeah, that's every the other part of the Judas story, you can't harmonize, and no. no one bothers it, because they can harmonize it to one little point, and it's like, they forget that, well, did he buy the field? Did the Pharisees buy the field? Was it called the field well, of see, blood because of this? It was called the field of blood because of that. Every and they part, have that in common, the field of blood, so does that make sense that would, there would be it's a historical core? Blood. It's definitely an etiological legend for how this place got its name, but they give two different reasons for why it got its name. Right, but don't and, you find that compelling and, that you might have a historical core that had separate traditions? Well, it makes me believe that, yeah, there was probably a potter's field called the Field of Blood, and Christians linked their story to it, and another Christian linked his story to it, and a third Christian linked his story to it. But we don't have an original 
Judas story that holds up. Okay. And even even the name Judas, even the name Judas is 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 symbolic, um, like the name of most of the apostles, like the name of most of the characters in the in the and the place names in the Gospels. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not as obvious to us, but in Greek, these were much more obvious. You know that Matthew comes from best, you know uh, J- Joseph of Arimathea comes from best discipleville, and also <laughs> to the point no one's ever been able to find Arimathea. You know, mm-hmm. and why there's so many guesswork on any town with an A or an R. You must be Arimathea's because they, they're, they're, those towns were made up. But one thing that you know you've been criticized for is that all the scholars, thousands of scholars, believe in the historical Jesus. Okay? I'm going to stop you there because <laughs> a <laughs> when you ask the scholars who, but, well, I say this in the thing in action that there's two basic family trees of Jesus. There's the Jesus of faith, and then there's the historical Jesus. And both of those are placeholders for this entire family tree of different Jesuses. If you get 50 secular biblical scholars in the same room and ask them who Jesus was, you're going to get 50 different Jesuses. And Robert Price points out that this very multiplicity is exactly the problem. He, he may have been a Galilean shaman. He may have been a, a progressive Pharisee. He may have been all these things, but he couldn't have very well been every single one of them at once. Right. And you have a... I don't give away anything in nail, but the fact that he was this amazing, incredible person, and yet no one in history seemed to notice him outside his own little cult for the better part of a century or more. And yet, as soon as he's meant to have died, um, you've got all these feuding house cults, not in Galilee, not in Judea, not in Jerusalem, but scattered all over the Roman Empire, and they can't agree about the first thing about his ministry or who his apostles were or what he taught. Or did he talk? Or did he do miracles? Or did he not do miracles? Um, the things that were tearing apart the early church make no sense if Jesus had already ruled on him the way he does in the Gospels. Mm-hmm. But and for me, that was that was enough right there. Is that that paradox is like something's very wrong with the the, the, the official story of Jesus. But you know, talking about experts in the field, you have someone like John Dominic Cross, who I'm sure you're familiar with who says if there's anything historical, it's that was Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River through the criteria of embarrassment, and that he was crucified, and he believes he what, didn't get a proper burial, he was just thrown at the side of the road. Well, I, to, to avoid a whole can of worms right now, I talk about all the criteria of uh, following people like Richard Carrier and uh, their analysis, and, and other, even historicists who have who've, uh, decided that, yeah, that criteria doesn't hold up. I talk about why they don't hold up and how they fail in the case of Jesus specifically, in Jesus mythic in action. Yeah, but multiple attestation, if you have different people at different times, you know, testifying to the same thing, do you not But do that we have that for Jesus? We don't have that for Jesus. Well, you have we've the got, crucifixion and all four Gospels. The problem shows us that our four main biographical sources, in fact, our only biographical sources come from those four books, and all of them are derived from, from Ma- the first Mark. Mark. Okay, so... That yeah. yeah, and... Okay. and, and, and all of them contain anachronisms and mistakes that show that they're written generations after the fact in places that are probably very far removed from knowing how actually Palestinian Jews lived. Um, Matthew is constantly correcting Mark's mistakes on that. Luke is constantly following Mark's mistakes on that. In geography, in basic Judaism, the trial account of Jesus is so full of anachronisms and, and, and just flat out wrong historical facts that I mean, they dogpile up so fast it's hard to keep up with them. So have you heard of um, And yet every single point in those, those weird conflicting tales has an allegorical reason, has a strong symbolic component to it that makes perfect sense as allegory. Have you heard of Tim McGrew, Christian apologist out of Michigan State, I believe it is? What's he written? Uh, well, his main thing is incidental consequences. There's things in the Gospels that support the letters and so forth. These little details that... You don't see, but they go and really support each other. Well, like, it sounds like he's uh, <laughs> swallowing the whale and choking on the minnow then, because uh, I, I would love to read what he has to say. But, and mean, he's, on YouTube. he's all over the place on YouTube, but a brilliant yeah. guy. I'll, I mean, check, it out. I'll just, check it out, but it seems like you have, to, you have to ignore a lot of big pick questions before you can nitpick and say, well, see, this, this right. can, you know, well, and like, uh, especially, you know, one of the four literary sources that are all derived from one. Well, you know, and one and of the criticisms of, of Mark is he doesn't know geography, that he goes 
50 miles out of his way to get someplace. Exactly. And what Tim McGrew says is, oh, well, the reason they did that was there was a mountain. And have you heard that apologetic? Well, I've heard the thing that, oh, he didn't really say he went from side on the tire. He, he said he went by way of them. And it's, it's, it's very, uh, it's very self-serving and very like, really, you, that's what you think happened that he went from there 50 miles out of his way and walked back to get to this place over here. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it kind of drives me crazy because it's like that's not the only time that you have to do incredibly mental gymnastics to make the, what the Bible says work. We're constantly having to do that throughout the Gospels and through the Old Testament too, for that matter. Well, but it's there's so many things, and trying to harmonize four different ones that are saying completely different things about what Jesus said and what he did and what he was. It it just it, there comes a point where it's like all right enough's enough how many times do we have to play this game how many times do we have to say that oh well he said he, he hung and he said he, he fell in a field because they fell off a cliff in the field it's like you know well, every, like, every part of these, some of these stories the feeding of the 5,000 well in Matthew you have the feeding of the 4,000 I listened to an expert in Matthew here at Southwestern Seminary talk about it and then a you know a few chapters later it's the 5,000 and he goes, oh, well, there's two feedings. And what other, I read the real scholars, and they go, you had two sources. He didn't know what to do with them, so he just, exactly. is that the right? Exactly. And if you read the story, it's not just that the numbers are different. Everything happens, and it's like, there, there's all these people. How are we going to feed them, Lord? Well, I'll do it like I did it last week. <laughs> <laughs> they, they wouldn't be so amazed. But the stories are exactly the same. And and we see that, especially with Matthew. Matthew doesn't like to to... He doubles up on everything. It's obvious that he's, you know, wants to include every old scripture reference that he can and not leave anything but out. see, here yeah. again, you have Matthew. You got Mark, a bare-bones resurrection there. The women see him and they just go and tell nobody. And then Matthew puts a Roman guard there. He has earthquakes splitting rocks, yeah. dead yeah. zombies going yeah. in Jerusalem. I mean, he doesn't know when to quit. You know, right. it's like, doesn't that show that you have a historical core with Mark and then Matthew just goes crazy with uh, legendary embellishment? It definitely shows legendary embellishment. In fact, the Gospel of Peter even goes worse than that. He's yeah. got <laughs> Jesus coming out of there, he's 500 feet tall, and then the cross comes out of the thing and talks to him. So there's definitely legendary embellishment, right. but that doesn't mean there's a historical core. That means what it, the core is Mark's allegory. And it feels like oh, even okay, in so Mark four eleven, he's even saying to the reader um, that this is the this is the key to the kingdom of heaven. This is a parable. This whole gospel I'm telling you is a parable. Um, and I think I think he expected his educated theological readers to know exactly what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Matthew goes out of his way to say, and this was done in order to fulfill this scripture that we got this story from. Mark just expects the smart ones who are educated in, in Greek styles and in, in Jewish theology to recognize what he's doing. And for the common people, the slaves and the women and the children, it's just a good story. You know, mm -hmm. we, see, we see that kind of split level inner circle, outer circle theology in a lot of old ancient religions like Mithraism and other mystery faiths. Mm -hmm. And Paul talks about Christianity as if it's a mystery faith. Well, by the way, have you been, were you ever a Christian? Oh, yeah, big time. Southern Baptist, the one true faith. Oh, wow, so was I that. I went to college. Wow. I went to college. What college yeah. did you go to? Sorry? What college did you go to? Oh, uh, well, I became a, a, a atheist when I was still in community college, but okay. I, I went to California State, Fresno. When did you become a Christian? Oh, I was raised Christian. So oh, where? From okay. The, from the cradle. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I was uh, a Christian at 17, and... Um, then, you know, I got into this old earth, young earth thing. And I just, that uh, really shook my faith because I just saw the, like you were talking about exegetical gymnastics they did both sides to get their stories. Well, the young earth or 6,000 years, I, I found out within weeks that was a big, I mean, the, the consensus is 4 billion, 13.7. So, you know, then I have to work through that. And then I go and meet Barter. I see him at Barnes & Noble. And then I go and he blows all my New Testament stuff away. Yes, I feel the same way. I think he's done more single-handedly to show, put the spotlight on biblical studies and the problems of biblical studies. And that actually, that's one thing I would like to say to anybody who's reading Mything in Action after you read Nailed, is all these things are true whether there was a Jesus or not. Whether Christianity is even true or not, all these things I'm telling you in this book are true. Um, you know, and one of the things I love you say, you say, I don't know who Jesus is and you don't either. One thing that drives me... <laughs> 
just drives me crazy about Christians is that, and I've heard Christian leaders, Sunday school teachers say, if you found the bones of Jesus, would that change your faith? And they go, no, uh, are you going to the retreat this weekend? And, oh, it isn't Bob Hip, you know, that music director. They could care less whether it's true or not. That's what drives me crazy. Does it drive and, you crazy? And that's, and that's what makes this argument between mythicism and historicists worth having at all, is that if nothing else, all the back and forth that we learn from this argument right. calls the bluff of anybody who tries to tell you they know how Jesus wants you to think or behave or vote. Mm-hmm. Full stop. And that that's really the only thing that makes it worth atheists having. And um, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's funny, it's, like me and James and I have more in common than uh, I do with atheists that, you know, have no clue what the Bible says or you know, historical critical research or whatever. Or even care. Or even care. About or even care. They don't even care. They don't even care. Uh, same with, you know, the Christians. It's just, um, yeah. so I can relate better to someone like you or James that actually yeah. we or are Sean on the McDonald same. McDonald for that. Huh? McDonald for that. Or yeah. So what would you like to tell our members that are going to be meeting this Friday about the book club and what you feel about this or whatever you want to say to them? Well, first of all, thank you for reading my book. I Absolutely. really appreciate that. I suspect you'll be split down the lines or whether you love it or hate it. And I <laughs> bet I could guess which half does. Um, <laughs> and honestly, I, I didn't write that to try to argue Christians out of their faith, but I wanted to pull for sure. I wanted to, to pull away the curtain from some of the bluff and the bluster right. of biblical studies. Um, and again, nailed was a sort of the opening salvo, the new book, uh, which is a three-volume book, actually. Jesus, Smithing in Action goes full bore. And if you like Nailed, you'll really like Smithing in Action. If you oh, hate Nailed, you'll really hate Jesus, Smithing in Action. Or maybe you'll <laughs> like it better because it's got more footnotes. It goes into more details. And it actually talks about where I think Christianity did come from whether the, rather than all the ways that Christianity fails the reality test, as I did in Nailed. Well, it's just a fascinating subject. And Christians need to look at this and see that, you know, is there a faith? For the real or not, you know, and but a lot of Christians are are, are scared. They they just think, oh my gosh, if I do that, I'm going to lose my husband, or I'm going to lose my friends, or the tr- and, where am I going to do? You know, and those are not small concerns either. It's like I've been saying before, and in fact, I think I said this to Sean McDowell. It most Christians I know are Christians for good, logical, rational reasons that have nothing to do with Christianity being good or logical, right. or rational. <laughs> That's a good um, point. And 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 and, and that's, that's kind of why I don't. I'm not trying to convince Christians of that. I'm just trying to point out some serious problems um, for atheists and um, a fascinating topic. And a fascinating topic too. And it's funny you say you don't like to start off with non-Christians with did Jesus exist? I love doing that. I've actually <laughs> because I like to go. Hey, are we going to go anywhere with this? Or are you just going to close down? Because most of them will just go. Look, I was highly offended. I meant for it to be offended. Because yeah. I want to well, know, I want to say that huh? if it's because it tends to be a discussion st- killer. Yeah, but, but I want to know: Are you serious about, about this? Are you serious about to look at the evidence? Yeah. You know, which to me shows that he existed, or are you just going to be in denial mode, which you know just drives me crazy? You know. Yeah, and that's that's why I think the athe- the atheist community is where this debate's happening. It's, I mean, Christians can't even enjoy a relaxed. No, you know, agnosticism, even for argument's sake, no. even for argument's sake. Yeah, no. it just it, it's sad, you know. So um, <laughs> anyway, well, thanks for man, really for visiting with us, and gosh, we're gonna love listening to you at the book club. And thanks for you know, I know you're really busy and you got a lot going on. So thanks for stopping by. I am, I am. But that said, if you guys have any questions, if any arguments pop oh. up and you need to do a follow up question, I would love to. Oh, well, thanks, Dave. Question. That's God. There's that's so nice much to unpacking this. This is a crazy subject. Boy, I'm sure James and I really appreciate that, and I'm sure the members will too. So, yeah, thank you very much. Absolutely. All right, best of luck, guys. All right, nice talking to you. You too.